Hey, welcome to our Bible study on 2 Peter 3. I'm Brian Minnick, pastor of Living Word Church. Um, thank you for uh, tuning in. Thank you for your uh, dedication. Many of you are watching and you're part of our church. And if you're not yet uh, connected, we invite you to reach out to us. We'd love to connect with you uh, long term, develop a relationship with you, get you into one of our groups if, uh, if you're open to that. And uh, to do that, just let us know. You can email info at livingwordworcester.com. And as always, we invite you to open up your copy of God's Word, uh, search the scriptures yourself. And if you have any questions, you can all feel welcome to, to email us, info at livingwordworcester.com, all one word, livingwordworcester.com. We'd be happy to engage with you and have further dialogue. Uh, Second Peter chapter 3 verse 1 just read a few verses and and then pose a few questions for our connect groups uh, for your conversations to emerge from this is now the second letter that I'm writing to you beloved in both of them I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and commandment of our Lord and Savior through your apostles we pause there so much of the context right at the beginning of this chapter is about uh, remembering. He uses this phrase two times. He's stirring up our mind to remember what was going on in Scripture, what was taught through uh, the Old Testament and what's being taught now through the apostles and what we would call the New Testament. What I'm going to ask you, for, if you're having a connect group and you're meeting in Zoom and having some questions, here's a question to just start out. What do you remember about Second Peter 3. What do you remember about the sermon? Let's just stimulate that memory. That's what Peter's calling us to do is kind of use some mental energy and recall and just share uh, if there's a, uh, a, a deadly silence then okay just move forward to the next question but hopefully there's a couple things that will come to mind of what you remember either in terms of the sermon itself uh, or what the Bible is actually saying. So, for instance, in the sermon, I talked about using uh, mnemonic devices, memory devices. In our home, and I'll just pan the camera slightly this way, there's the dry erase board I referenced where we put a lot of stuff about our calendar and schedule so we can all um, look at it and then be reminding one another of what's coming up in, uh, in the course of a week. So anything about the sermon or Second Peter 3 uh, that comes to mind, share that. And then secondly, there's a very interesting word. Uh, it's two words in English that shows up here, stir up. Um, so another question would be, what stirs up in you when you think about the day of the Lord, the judgment uh, and destruction of the ungodly? When we think about the second coming of Jesus, which now will be uh, referred to in Second Peter 3 as the day of the Lord, and on that day, there'll be a judgment uh, for the ungodly. What, what stirs up in you? What comes to your mind, your emotions? How do you initially react and respond? Share that one with another. I think that's really important that we recognize there may be a, a variety of responses and emotions that are stirring in us. Uh, and that's what really in, is invoked in the word to stir up. It has to do with something being placid and calm, and then all of a sudden it's very energized and and even turbulent. So we want to recognize what those emotions are, what those thoughts are, how do we um, how do we uh, interpret them is really kind of the next part of our time together. So let me read um, a little bit here. There's an attempt by Peter. Uh, which I think is well taken to assuage uh, our fears by first informing us in chapter 2 that there's going to come all kinds of false teachers that are are going to try and lead us astray regarding the day of the Lord and the coming of Christ. And he adds to that um, the issue of scoffers. So we'll read from uh, verse 3 on. Knowing this first of all that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing following their own sinful desires they will say where is the promise of his coming for ever since the fathers fell asleep all things are continuing 
as they were from the beginning of creation. But what he's saying here is, you know, in addition to false teachers who are going to try to veer us off the path, there's going to be some who are just going to say, oh, pff, wow, you believe that? No way. And they're going to uh, uh, mock or insult or scoff at the idea that there would be any kind of judgment for humanity. And Peter, uh, you know, says they're, they're going to say as an argument, look, from the beginning of time, life just keeps going on. It just keeps chugging along and we don't have to worry about the finality. There's no end. It just, we, it just goes forward. And uh, Peter then makes his argument based on uh, the fact of Scripture as it records an earlier judgment by God for our sin and our rebellion. And he writes it this way. For they, referring to the scoffers, deliberately overlook this fact, that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God, and that by means of these the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. He's referring to the flood. Uh, he's referring to Noah uh, being saved, and we heard about that in chapter 2. He's referring to the destruction of uh, humanity as a judgment for the sin and rebellion, uh, which had um, uh, come to a tipping point. And so he's saying, wait a minute, anyone who's saying there is no final judgment forgets history. This has already happened. This was already uh, recorded in history. And for some of you, you you've got uh, a biblical literacy and you'll recall that. I invite you to turn back to Genesis and reread that account. Some of us may be listening and, and we're not familiar with that story. Please turn to Genesis and read that account. And I also want to invite you, if you're not a believer yet in God's word and you're not sure, there's, there is some physical evidence. It's I understand in, in dispute or in dialogue, but there's some physical evidence on our earth, geographically speaking, that there was uh, pretty cat cataclysmic events uh, that happened in the forging of what we consider our earth now. Uh, so these could be done through volcanoes and certainly can be done and accomplish these cataclysmic forces that, that forge uh, mountains and rivers and gorges uh, also can be attributed to the flowing of water. And uh, so often that's attributed to these kind of long-term erosion impacts. Um, but certainly the, the force of water as in a flood, whether it was a regional flood uh, or a global flood. And then we think of the, the idea of water coming down from above as it speaks about in Genesis are coming up from the water uh, underneath the earth. Uh, we know that that's tremendous force and when you get that much movement uh, in the uh, atmosphere there's going to be temperature change and climate change and we also know that there were uh, dramatic climate changes throughout history and in ice ages and uh, and I say we know that again uh, through through science, we're we're looking at those theories and saying, is there enough credible evidence to back up that theory? And all of these things can be discussed in dialogue or disputed or argued. But what I'm proposing now is that based on the Word of God, we know there was a flood, and I'm comfortable in that regard. My first degree uh, in academics was a Bachelor of Science in Geography from Pennsylvania State University. And so I studied, on some level, climatology and uh, such forces of uh, Earth that can move and have dramatic impact. So I would say there's an argument from science, and that's, I think, what Peter's uh, bringing to our mind now. So with that being said, then he points to the coming judgment. But by the same word, verse 7, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and the destruction of the ungodly. So where Genesis is speaking to us about uh, the flood and, and God's plan to uh, restore the earth, and we're looking here at uh, Genesis 5, 6, 7, 8 uh, into uh, 9, we're also told that this rainbow 
that appears is a sign to us that God will not destroy the earth by water. And now Peter is telling us in agreement, yes, that's true. The earth will now be undergoing its judgment, its renewal through fire. So, oh, there's glory in. She just tripped. <laughs> And so this idea of fire is what comes, and, and you can imagine perhaps as you have seen books and paintings and pictures when we think of, uh, of hell uh, and eternal judgment, there's often fire associated with that. Here fire is going to uh, you know, serve as a, as a, a, a way perhaps to, to judge and destroy as well as I'll add maybe purify and renew because Peter's going to point to a new heavens and a new earth. Verse 8, do not overlook this one fact. So this is great because we know why scoffing happens. It's because people are saying, well, fine, if it's the last days, then where is it? Then how come it hasn't happened? And people will often point in recent history and say, oh, you know, the things were really bad before, but we made it through. And so Peter says, well, don't overlook this. Don't, don't miss this point, beloved. That with the Lord, one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. It gives this wonderful, I think, renewing picture of... Um, Whatever someone might say about delay, or whatever someone might be saying, this will never happen because it's never happened. Uh, Peter's saying, no, no, just remember the character of God. He's love, and the first definition in 1 Corinthians 13 is love is patient. And here we get a demonstration of God's patience that as he's organizing time, he's trying to uh, and, and working with our sense of... Um, his revelation and our understanding of his revelation and our response to his revelation, uh, namely of Jesus Christ, that we would be called to repentance. So he's super slow in that regard, wishing that all would say yes to Jesus and turn from our old life and embrace a new life with Jesus. And this is a wonderful invitation. And I think the heart of what, um, Peter's trying to communicate that we have to be ready as believers uh, to handle the false teaching and the scoffing, and we should be keeping in the forefront of our mind the good arguments. Wait a minute. God will judge. He's already done that through the flood, but he will save, and he saves Noah, and he saves those family members who followed and believed in God, and he will continue to do that uh, for us who believe in Jesus and are faithful, and he's inviting others into that through salvation in Jesus' name and repentance from sin. So this is the nature of our God. It's not to destroy. He's not. That's not his first priority. His first priority is to save. But in the end, not because of his uh, uh, love alone, but we must combine his character in full. His holy love demands... Uh, that all the uncleanness of the world be, be dealt with because he himself is pure and holy and cannot embrace, cannot wrap his arms around um, this rebellion and this filth and still be holy. Of course, the good news is he sent uh, Jesus, God the Father uh, sends Jesus, now Jesus and the Father send the Spirit, and here we have this wonderful sense of God's presence with us who believe in him, uh, but also the covering that we needed from that rebellion and the transformation, the renewal that we have in our hearts as once who walked in darkness, but now in light, once who rebelled, but now follow. So there's this invitation that's here, and I don't want us to miss that. So I'm going to ask you, if you're a believer in Jesus, have you ever encountered a scoffer who's come against the second coming of Christ? If so, share that account within your group. And also ask, if you're not yet a believer, what questions remain for you? What are those uh, kind of big ticket items where you're thinking, I don't know, I, I, have, I have some uh, reservations, I'm just not sure. Just write those down, and if you're in inclined, email us, and, and perhaps we can start a dialogue through uh, social media or, or email or a phone call and uh, 
and begin to, to unpack that together and answer those. And we'll trust that it will eventually draw you uh, to a, a loving understanding and an informed understanding of God's plan and his love and his holiness. Also then want to continue and be mindful of the time. Thank you for giving so much uh, to hear the word of God, particularly during these uh, kind of strange uh, times we find ourselves in. But I want to encourage you. I, I, I find myself needing the good news, meaning the scriptures, more and more and more as I encounter the news of the day, as I encounter the news of our world. Uh, I'm in desperate need for this good news, and uh, it's satisfying. It's helpful. It grounds me, and I'm hopeful that this uh, brief study will, will um, provide the same for you. So reading on, verse uh, 10, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done in it will be exposed. Now we're speaking of all that's going to happen on the day the Lord returns, and there's a, a suddenness to it for some, and that's this imagery of a thief. And I want to encourage you to uh, what's called cross-reference this, meaning allow the scriptures to speak uh, meaning and understanding into the scriptures. And I'm going to ask you to reference Matthew 24 particularly verses 36 through 51. For in this passage, Jesus speaks both to Noah's flood and salvation from the flood, as well as this notion of a thief. And in Matthew 24, in that passage, we, we, we hear from Jesus the, the impact of it all. And it's not to cause fear for you, the believer, but it's to help everyone who's hearing understand how the normalcy of life will just churn on. In that way, the scoffers are true. Life just goes on, but then suddenly, it doesn't. Suddenly, Jesus breaks in. And so the call for the Christian is to be ready for that and to live our lives with reference to that moment. That we should be living our lives with a reference. In other words, if we know Jesus is returning, then how our life leads up to that point uh, should be very thoughtful and intentional to God's plan for our lives so that we ourselves are ready. And in Matthew 24, it will give us some instruction about being faithful to be found doing the things our master has told us to do when he comes. So it's not just being ready, but it's being faithful. It's doing and being the person that God wants us to be. So when he returns, he doesn't find us asleep. He doesn't find us uh, in, 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 in laps. He finds us uh, eager and ready, and as we read on, Peter will give us some instruction to that uh, as well. Verse 11, since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of the Lord? Pause there. What he's saying in some kind of uh, wood-like English uh, hey, at the end of all this analysis, then what kind of person should we be? If Jesus is coming back, how do we live our lives now? And where Matthew's gospel is going to say, be faithful and be ready. Second uh, Peter, Peter's telling us, uh, strive for holiness and godliness. And this points us back to chapter one, where he says, hey, it's awesome that you have faith in Jesus. And now add to that faith virtue and add to that faith knowledge and begins to work and includes godliness. And he's telling us, that's great that you're a believer in Jesus, you have faith, that's what it means to believe, and that faith is now active, and grow in that faith. Keep that faith alive and growing and well, and you don't have to be afraid that when he comes back, you're going to be unprepared. And this idea of holiness is, is understanding that Jesus is coming back because he's coming back for his holy bride. He's coming back for people who've been uh, sanctified is a fancy word for kind of made pure. We've gone through this process of adding to our faith the virtue and the knowledge and the self-control and the godliness and brotherly affection and love. And we're, in other words, we're, we're, we're changing. We're becoming new creatures not just when Jesus returns, but that process has already begun. 
and he's saying allow that process to happen uh, and and in so doing you're, you're you're calling forward a desire for Jesus to return we're not saying oh boy I hope he doesn't come back because I just want to keep doing what I want to do we're embracing the presence of Jesus in our life now so that when he returns it's just a another step another another continuation of what we have now we should never be afraid that Jesus is going to return because we should be longing to be with Jesus now actually it should be the opposite we should be excited that he's going to return and that's what language is here is talking about hastening it's like wow let it happen soon because I'm excited and this would be the same if we take our earthly relationships and apply them to the language of scripture so for instance if the scripture says we're bride and Jesus is groom uh, this is the kind of excitement that we should be looking forward to on a kind of wedding day it's like man this is going to be great we're prepared we're ready we're found faithful we're doing everything and then on that day there's great excitement and really every day now there's also if we're honest a little nervousness because we're not sure exactly how everything's gonna go but that's different than anxiety or worry or doubt you know it's like getting ready for a great sporting event if you're an athlete you know you're getting ready for the big game and there's a nerve that's there there's a there's a tension that's there but that tension usually is 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 our way of our body physically and emotionally and in this case as Christians spiritually preparing itself we're getting ready we're getting ready to uh, to, to go and 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 be all that we uh, are designed to be and so it's a moment it's a big moment it's the biggest moment perhaps of, of human history in that Jesus has come and then will come again and so we should have that uh, that understanding that if there's a little nervousness like oh what's going to happen and what's that going to be like and I hope I'm prepared that I, I just want to assure you or encourage you is a better word that I, I personally in my opinion is that's okay but we shouldn't be afraid and we shouldn't be um, uh, be in any way uh, terrorized by that we should be no no it's just a big day and I'm gonna get ready for it and when Jesus comes I might be a little nervous to see him um, but boy just like when a bride and a groom lock eyes and see one another on their wedding day there's such a love and an affection and it pushes all that forward and that's what Jesus is encouraging I think us to consider through his word given through Peter so we'll wrap it up with a few more uh, verses. Verse 12, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved and the heavenly bodies will melt as they will burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for the new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. So he mentions this idea of fire and burning and it's really twice that he talks about these heavenly bodies being uh, dissolved. It's an interesting word translation, and I will simply mention it. The word that was being translated dissolve uh, could also be set free, loosen, untie, destroy, dismiss, pull down, or break up. One definition of it is to loose anything bound or compacted together. So I, I sense in this uh, the uh, the option that uh, everything could be totally destroyed what we now know and something brand new created I I can see that and hear that and uh, my mind immediately says oh yeah and you know what that might be strange and might be scary but I I'd be happy with that a new and improved earth where uh, everything functions the way it's supposed to function and the air is clean and and righteousness dwells. In other words, everything is set right. Everything is is working as God ordained, which was really his um, original creation. He called it all good in Genesis 1 and 2. And then Genesis 3, we have our entrance of sin and the initial judgment. So prior to the flood, there was a judgment of our sin, but also a grace extended to us. Meaning God didn't destroy us, but the effects of sin began to impact us through disease and death and harshness and all of that is an impact of the choice that was made by uh, our foremother and forefather Adam and Eve 
But there's also another option here which would, would play out uh, as well. And again, I draw on my geography degree uh, to inform this, and I think it's somewhat informed by uh, the language in, in the original Greek, is that if everything that is compacted together is going to be loosed, if there's going to be a fire that's going to be set and it's going to uh, combust all of these things, we see that maybe as an example now in a great forest fire in that the forest uh, has all this compacted material and in many cases our fire prevention policies over the last 100 or 200 years have added to that. There's a lot of deadfall in the forest and uh, we immediately eradicate fire <laughs> as soon as we can so the kind of slow burning natural occurrence of lightning on dry tinder in a forest is supposed to renew. It's supposed to burn away all of that tinder and then provide new growth, new uh, and better soil conditions for uh, little uh, saplings to grow. It's actually a, a positive impact, but when we, through our fire prevention and other measures, want to protect houses and so forth, allow fires to be put out so quickly, we allow that, that compacted material to build up. And now when the fire's lit, it, it's not a, a fire that slowly burns over and, and purifies. It's this raging fire and can be very destructive. And so that's just some imagery that comes to my mind. And, and if that be the case, if there's, if there's a natural, so to speak, uh, correlation, it might be that God destroys the earth as we know it by fire, and it's for a purifying effect. It's for this entire project to be made new, uh, both in the in what we would consider the heavens, the skies, as well as uh, the earth around us. And boy, we need it. If anything, uh, then the coronavirus, we have at least have some reports that due to the, the lower number of cars on the road, the emissions are so much lower, there's there's actually been a purification of the air. And uh, all of this is, is, is um, uh, I think, what will come about in the creation and recreation uh, that Peter's speaking of. New heavens and a new earth. We're going to be able to breathe right, live right, be in God's presence and his righteousness. So it's very, very, very positive news. Our life may look... Um, somewhat similar to what it does now and maybe different. I'll leave some of that for another another Bible study. But want to close and pray for you, giving you a few questions to consider. And uh, I think the last, if you're part of a connect group, is always to pray one for another. We want to pray that we can grow in godliness, holiness. We can be ready and be found faithful. Those are the big, the big ticket items. And if we're doing those things, we never have to be worried or concerned, like, am I going to make it? I mean, if we're just loving Jesus more and more every day, uh, walking into um, the next phase of that is the new heavens and the new earth. For all who do not know Jesus, uh, the, the reality of judgment will be, will be more harsh and more severe and, and, and catch them completely off guard. And that should impact our behavior as well. From my view as a pastor, that should promote in us a heart to share the good news of Jesus, a heart to, to be compassionate to those around us in such a way to, um, to deliver God's word to them, to try and convince people to be uh, passionate about giving our finances so that others can, can go around the globe and do the same. Um, it should be a priority, in other words, because we understand the day of the Lord will come. It should motivate and inform our daily life now. So let's pray those things together. Our Lord, we thank you uh, for making a way for all of humanity to hear about the good news before you come. You promised that in Matthew 24, all the nations will receive the proclamation of the good news. For us who've already received and accepted and experienced your new life, we say thank you. We look for and long for you. We want to grow in godliness and holiness. We want to be found ready and faithful. And we also want to live our days with respect to that final day. So reprioritize. Lord, help us organize 
help us think clearly. And surely when scoffers come or false teachers come, help us understand the truth of your word and use your word to refute those arguments. So bring us great knowledge of your word, comfort by your Holy Spirit, and also an urgency from your spirit that will desire and long for you more than we ever have. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.